Hey guys, welcome to the chapter two virtual lecture here. Today we're going to talk about classification, survey of microbial world, and microscopy. So classification is how we name and organize living organisms. Um, another term for this is taxonomy. So organisms are broadly classified as either prokaryotic or eukaryotic. Prokaryotes include bacteria, archaea, eukaryotic microbes are fungi like molds and yeast, protozoans, algae, and parasitic worms, and some plants and animals. So classification, our broadest scale here, are the three domains of life. So all living things fit in one of these three categories. They're either bacteria, archaea, or eukarya. And of course, all life on Earth shares a common ancestor. Biologists, specifically taxonomists, group organisms into similar categories called taxa. The simplest taxonomic classification So if we look here at the very top, we have the three broadest categories, our domain. And then each domain is broken down into kingdoms. Each kingdom is broken down into phyla. Each phylum is broken down into classes. Classes can be further separated down into orders. Orders can be subdivided into families. Families can be broken down by genus. And then within every genus, there's at least one species. And we use these last two parts, the genus and the species, to make up the scientific name for all living organ or for each living organism. So for humans, we're genus Homo species sapiens, and our scientific name is Homo sapiens. All right, so naming and classifying microbes, we use this nomenclature as a system of naming organisms. It was developed originally in 1735 by Carlos Linnaeus. And scientific nomenclature assigns two names to every organism. So the genus, or plural genera, is the first name, and the first letter is always capitalized. So there's very specific ways that scientific names are written. The specific epithet, or the species name, follows the genus and is not capitalized. For example, Streptococcus pyogenes is written correctly with a capitalized genus, lowercase species, and is italicized. Or you could also write it correctly, Streptococcus pyogenes with the genus capitalized, species lowercase, but underlined instead of italicized. It's especially important when you're handwriting, and italics are hard to do with handwriting. All right, in microbiology, sometimes we further divide things by strain or serotype. So organisms of the same species. However, the organisms show slightly different traits like antibiotic resistance. For example, Escherichia coli 0157H7 is a disease causing strain of the common E. coli, which is found in our bodies. All right, so these names can describe an organism. Staphylococcus aureus, the prefix staphylo, means clustered arrangements of cells. Coccus tells us that the cells are spherical in shape. And aureus is the Latin word for golden, which is the color of these organisms' colonies. So staphylococcus would be clusters of spherical cells that are golden in color. Sometimes names honor a researcher, like Escherichia coli, is discovered in 1885, named after Theodore Eiserich Escherich, who discovered the organism in feces. All right, and sometimes they describe a habitat. So coli reminds us that E. coli live in the colon or large intestine. 
Which of the following is the correct way to type a scientific name? Got it? It's D. D is correct because the genus is capitalized but not the species and it's all in italics. All right, are the following two organisms related? Streptococcus pneumoniae and Mycoplasma pneumoniae. Think about it. All right, the best answer here is no. Although all living organisms do share a common ancestor, these two are not closely related because the two genuses are different. Even though the specific epithets are the same, they're both pneumoniae, the genuses are different. The genera are different. All right, can we tell if these two organisms are related? S. aureus and S. pyogenes? No, we can't, because we don't know what the S stands for. Okay, but how about if we write them out this way? Are these two things related? Staphylococcus aureus and Staphylococcus epidermidis. Yes, these two organisms are closely related because they share the same genus, Staphylococcus. All right, so let's survey the variety of microbes on Earth. So bacteria, as I mentioned in the last lecture, are going to be the major focus of this class, but we will touch on the others as well. So bacteria are in domain prokarya. They're prokaryotes. They're single-celled. Their cells don't have a membrane-bound nucleus. They do contain a single circular chromosome but they're much smaller than eukaryotic cells. They're found everywhere that there's sufficient moisture, so there's very little that limits the presence of bacteria, apart from moisture content. They reproduce asexually by binary fission. That would be a great term to put in your notes, guys. Bacteria reproduce asexually by a process called binary fission. And bacterial cell walls contain peptidoglycan, and they can live in some extreme environments. They're estimated to have been here on Earth for three and a half billion years. And Earth itself, if you remember, is about 4.6 billion years old. So after less than a billion years of Earth's existence, bacteria had evolved. They have the largest biomass on Earth. So if we were to round up all the bacteria on Earth and weigh them, they would weigh more than any other group of living things. And interesting, I think, less than 1% of all bacteria have actually been grown or cultured in the lab. Now, here's a picture of two eukaryotic cells. You can see the nuclei of the eukaryotic cells and the well-defined cell membranes here. So these are epithelial cells or skin cells. And then you can also see sprinkled around here the much smaller bacteria. And if you look down here at the scale bar, this distance is 20 microns or 20 micrometers. All right, cell morphology and arrangement are determined usually by microscopic analysis. So cellular morphology, or the shape of the cells, come in three basic shapes. There are cocci, which are spherical, bacilli, or rod-shaped, and spirals, like spirillum or spirochetes. There are some other shapes as well, like vibrio, coxobacillus, and pleomorphic, but they're much less common. Here's some examples. All right, and the arrangements of these different shapes of cells also have names. So a string of cocci would be streptococci. Groups of four are tetrads. 
groups of eight are sarsini, and large clusters are staphylococci. Uh, for the bacillus, you might have a single bacillus. If you have doubles together, those are diplobacilli. A string of bacilli together are streptobacilli. And we may also have some that are lined up together, like logs or V-shaped. The log, sh log arrangements are side by side or palisades. All right, another domain of life, apart from the bacteria, are archaea. And archaea share a lot of the same characteristics as bacteria. However, they do differ from bacteria in that archaean cell walls are mainly composed of polymers, not peptidogly peptidoglycan. And they usually live in some really extreme environments like methanogens in the rumen of uh, like cows and goats and deer. All right, let's talk about some eukaryotic microbes now. So eukaryotes are things like algae. So algae can be unicellular or multicellular. They have cellulose cell walls. They're photosynthetic, and they produce molecular oxygen. Protozoans are single-celled eukaryotes. They're similar to animals in cell structure. They live freely in water, and some even have animal hosts. Most are asexual, but some do sexual reproduction. And most are capable of locomotion or moving around. Some have pseudopodia, some use cilia, tiny hairs, and some have flagella. Fungi are another group of eukaryotic microbes. They obtain food from other organisms, so they're heterotrophs. They don't do photosynthesis. They possess cell walls with chitin, which is a special type of carbohydrate. And they include molds and mushrooms, which are multicellular. They can grow as long filaments and are reproduced by sexual and asexual spores. Yeasts, however, are unicellular and reproduced by budding or sexual spores. Helminths are multicellular worms. They're parasitic flatworms and roundworms. They have microscopic stages in their life cycles, like tapeworm and guinea worm. All right, so a parasitic guinea worm is removed from the subcutaneous tissue of a patient by winding it onto a stick. The procedure may have been used for the design of the symbol in part A. So the rod of Asclepius is the symbol of the medical profession. Viruses are another class of microbes. They're obligate intracellular parasites. They can't reproduce on their own. They have to use a host cell's machinery and nutrients to replicate themselves. They are much smaller than bacteria and other living cells. So you can see at the top here, the red virus. This is a bacteriophage. Phage are a type of virus that infect bacteria. So the blue circular cocci shape there, that is a bacterial cell. And what they do is they attach on the surface of the cell, kind of like a mosquito. And they have a structure that penetrates the cell membrane of the bacteria and the cell wall. And they inject their genetic material into the bacterial cell. Some viruses have RNA, some have DNA. But that genetic material, once it's in the cell, takes over the host cell. And the host cell begins creating more virus particles. So you see the virus is assembling inside the cell there. Eventually, the infected cell will become so full of virus particles that it will burst and release those viruses into the environment or if it's in a human cell into the body 
to go and infect more cells. And it kind of looks like the Mars rover. All right, so in the microbial world, on the left here, we have organisms, living things. And the three domains of living things are bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And bacteria and archaea together, we call those groups prokaryotes. Eukarya are eukaryotes. Of the eukaryotic life, algae, protozoa, fungi, and some helminths are all microscopic life, microbes. There are other infectious agents, but they're non-living. Viruses, viroids, and infectious proteins called prions. These are all infectious agents, but they're not living things. All right. Thank you guys for watching.